So for thousands of years, well, really probably millions of years, our ancestors have looked up at the sky and wondered what's up there. And they've also have started to wonder, hmm, could we be alone in this planet? Now, I'm fortunate that I get, to pay, get paid to actually ask some of those questions, and sort of bad news for you, your tax dollars are paying me to try to answer some of those questions. But then about 10 years ago, I was told, I mean asked, if I would start to look at the technology to help get us off planet. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So playing to the local crowd, this is what it looks like in your day-to-day -day life in Boston. But as you start to go off planet, things look very, very different. So there we are, hovering above the WGBH studios. And here's a very famous picture that Frank Borman took of the Earth rise from the moon. And you can see the Earth starting to recede. And then what I love is this picture that was taken from the surface of Mars looking back at the Earth. Can anyone find the Earth? I'm going to help you out a little. <laughs> Yeah. The point of showing this is that when people start to go to Mars, they're not going to be able to keep calling in and being micromanaged the way people on space station are. They're going to have to be independent. So even though they're up there, they're going to be all sorts of things that they're going to need, just like people on Earth need things like, oh, transportation, life support, food, clothing, and so on. But unlike on Earth, they're also going to need oxygen. They're going to have to deal with about a third of the gravity that we have here. They're going to have to worry about habitats, power, heat, light, and radiation protection, something that we don't actually worry about nearly as much on the Earth because we have this beautiful atmosphere and magnetosphere. The problem with that is that we also have a lot of constraints. So the biggest one for us is up mass. And the number that I've used for years is it costs about $10,000 to launch a can of Coke into low Earth orbit, which I calculated the other day is approximately 10 apples if you're not used to cans of Coke. The problem is there you are with $10,000 later, and you're still in low Earth orbit. You're not even at the moon or Mars or anything else. So you're going to have to try to figure out how to keep the mass as low as possible so you don't have to launch it. But on top of that cost issue with the mass, you also have problems of storage and flexibility and reliability. You can't just get there and say, oops, I forgot to bring because Amazon.com just does not deliver to Mars. So you better be prepared. So what is the solution for this? And I'm going to propose to you for the rest of this talk that the solution actually is life. And when you start to look at life as a technology, you realize, ah, that's it. That's exactly what we needed. This plant here, like every person here, and every one of your dogs and cats and plants and so on all started as a single cell. So imagine you're starting as a very low up mass object and then growing into something a good deal bigger. Now, my hero Charles Darwin, um, of course, reminds us that there's no such thing as a designer in biology, but what if, what if we now have the technology to design biology? maybe even design, oh, whole new life forms that can do things for us that we couldn't have imagined otherwise. So, um, years ago, I was asked to start to sell this program, and um, while I was doing that, I was put in front of a panel at um, NASA, as you might sort of imagine, a bunch of people in suits and white shirts and pencil protectors, and I did this sort of, you know, crazy wild, this is all the, you know, the next great thing, and I thought they would be blown over. And instead, the chairman of the committee just looked at me straight in the eye and said, uh, so what's the big idea? So I was like, okay, you want Star Trek? We'll do Star Trek. And so let me tell you what the big idea is. Well, we've used organisms to make biomaterials 
for years. So here's a great picture taken um, outside of Glasgow, and you can see lots of great biomaterials there. There are trees that you could use to build houses. There are sheep where they, you could get your wool from. Um, you could get leather from the sheep. I Just quickly glancing around the room, I bet there's no one in this room that doesn't have some kind of animal or plant product on them, some kind of biomaterial. But you know what? We're not going to take sheep and trees and stuff to Mars. That's nuts because of the upmass problem. But we are going to take things like this. This is Bacillus subtilis. Those white dots that you see are spores. This happens to be a bacterium that can form incredibly resistant spores. And when I say incredibly resistant, they've proven themselves. Bacillus subtilis spores have been flowing on what was called LDEF, a long duration exposure facility for almost six years. And some of them survived that in space. Unbelievable, a lot better than any of us can do. So why not just take the capabilities like to make wood or to make wool or spider silk or whatever and put them in Bacillus subtilis spores and take those with you to off planet. So what are you going to do when you're off planet? Here's a, an iconic picture of Buzz Aldrin looking back at the eagle when he landed, oh, it was almost 50 years ago on the surface of the moon. Now, if you're going to go to the moon for three days and you're the first person to set foot, yeah, you can live in a tin can, but you wouldn't want to do that for, say, a year and a half. So I did actually a calculation, being in California. Um, I looked at what the average size of a cell at Alcatraz is, and I got news for you. The volume in the Eagle there, in the lunar module, was about the size of a cell at Alcatraz if it were only five feet high. So incredibly cramped living quarters. You just can't ask a human to stay in there for long periods of time. So why not take these biomaterials and make something? So here's an image that a colleague of mine, who's an architect, Chris Maurer, um, has done of what we've been proposing. And we'll get to the point of why I've been standing up here holding something that looks like a dried sandwich this whole lecture. So we propose that the solution to the habitat problem on Mars could just simply lie in a fungus. So I'm now probably going to turn off everyone from ever eating a mushroom again. So let's, let's talk about fungi for a second. So you're probably familiar with this fruiting body of the fungus. That's the mushroom. But what we're interested in actually is what's beneath the surface there, the mycelium, which are these root hair-like structures that are really the main part of the mushroom. Well, it turns out you can take those, there's a micrograph I did, and you can put them in a mold and give them a little food, and it doesn't take much. You can grow these things on sawdust and so on. So this piece here was growing on sawdust. And that mycelium then will fill that structure to make something. Um, we've actually tried growing mycelium on Mars simulant, simulant, so no one's actually gone to the surface of Mars, but this is simulating the surface of Mars, and you can see those hair-like mycelia out there. It's really amazing stuff. Um, how strong can you make these things? Well, you know, I could give you numbers and tests and so on, but I think that's probably the best way to describe it. There's one of my students proving that you can do this. Um, to do this, then, you've got to figure out how to put it in context. How's this actually going to happen? I mean, this is a great idea, Lynn, but how are you going to get from here to there? So what we're saying is you grow up the mycelium in the lab, for example, and then you fill up a little structure, maybe a house-like structure that's tiny, that um, is maybe a double-bagged sort of plastic thing, like an inflatable, I sort of think L.L. Bean when I see this, and then you put it in a rocket ship and you send it off to Mars, Come on, launch, 10, 9, 8, all that. Um, and at some point, you get to Mars, rocket lands, you release the bag, and you add a little water, and voila, you've got your habitat. You know, how cool would that be? And the beauty of that is you don't have to take something pre-built. And so our estimates are that we could save 90% of the mass that mass is currently proposing by taking up a big steel structure if we actually grow it on site. So let me give you another big idea. What about digital information? What's really interesting is you have a physical link to your parents, and they have a physical link to their parents, and so on, all the way back to the origin of life. You have never broken that continuum.
But the fact is that we can do that today. So we have students every day in our labs, um, students in Boston even do this, that make up DNA sequences, and they hit the send button, and they send them to their local DNA synthesis company. Now, once you've made that physical link, break that physical link where you're sending it across town, it doesn't matter if you're sending it across the Charles River or if you're sending that information to Mars. You've broken that physical link. So then, once you're on Mars or across the river or wherever, you can take that digital information, synthesize the physical DNA, put it maybe in another organism, and voila, you've got new capabilities there. So again, you've broken that physical link. That's huge. What about chemistry? Biology does chemistry for us on Earth, and again, has for literally thousands of years. I bet virtually everyone in this room has eaten something today that has been made by biology doing chemistry. Let me give you a big hint there. What about another idea? What about using DNA itself to make a wire? So again, we're trying to miniaturize everything. DNA is really cheap. Strawberries have a gazillion amount of DNA. You know, you could take a strawberry with you, isolate the DNA, and one of my students has figured out a way to take DNA and tweak it a little bit so that you can incorporate silver atoms in very specific places, thus making an electrical wire. How cool is that? So while we're on the subject of metals, we're going to need to use metals for things like integrated circuits, um, probably we're going to want it for some structures, and so on. And things like integrated circuits ultimately go bad. Um, we could talk a lot about that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that, that they do go bad. And so where are you going to get those metals? Yeah, you could try to mine them with heavy equipment, but you get that up mass problem. I always tell people the best way to find the metals for a new cell phone is in a dead cell phone. So what if you take biology as the technology to get these metals out? And how do you do this? Well, take a look at the back of a vitamin bottle and you get an idea of all the sorts of metals that we actually use in our bodies. So we have a lot of proteins as well as other organisms that can actually specifically bind metals. So what if we now take those proteins and maybe attach them to this fungal mycelium and make a filter so we can start to pull those metals out in a very specific way without big mining equipment? And even better, we've actually done a proof of concept where we've then taken those metals that we pulled out with proteins and reprinted an integrated circuit using a plasma printer. You know, again, how cool. Electricity, I was asked by um, the head of one of the, the NASA centers, if you could ever take chemical energy and turn that into electrical energy. Well, the great news is it's not just the electric eel that does it. Everybody in this room who is still alive and functioning is doing that. Part of the food that you've eaten today has gone to operate the nerve cells in your body. But even other organisms, non-sentient ones, are creating electrical energy, even bacteria. Some bacteria are very good at making little wires. So if we can harvest that ability of turning chemical energy into electrical energy, again, how cool would that be? So here's some of the big ideas we talked about. Let me try one more. Life 2.0. So for example, all of the sugars in our body are right-handed. Why shouldn't we make an organism with left-handed sugars? Why not make an organism that can do things that no organism can do today? So organisms normally have evolved to live in very specific environments. So here's this lion cub literally up a tree, and I took a picture of him a bit later, and he's a lot happier when he was down on the ground. So organisms are designed for specific environments, but what if you can go back to that idea of synthetic biology and tweak them around? So here's one of our favorite places in Yellowstone National Park. This is Octopus Springs. If you tilt your head a little bit, it sort of looks like a body and, and tentacles coming out. It's above the boiling temperature of water. Those organisms that you see on the edge and the colors actually match the temperatures that are there. Very, very high temperature thermophiles. 
So why not take organisms that can live extremes, whether it's high temperature or low temperature or low pH or high pH or high salt or high levels of radiation, and take some of those capabilities and put it into other organisms? This is a project that my students have called, and I, I love this, the hell cell. And so we've done that. We've taken organisms and sort of tweaked them and pushed them to the edges. And this is important for getting us off planet and also for understanding what life is like in the universe. So let me give you just a couple of final thoughts. First is this whole idea that we have all these needs for human settlement off planet that are in some ways exactly like we have on the Earth, that we need the food and we need the shelter and so on, but we have very, very different constraints of this up-mass problem and the reliability and the flexibility and so on. But because we have these constraints that you don't have here where you might have to think about the indigenous petrochemical industry or whatever, you now have constraints that have to unleash creativity. And once you unleash this creativity because you have the new constraints, you're forcing game-changing technological advances that you wouldn't have gotten any other way. Finally, we have to think a little bit, is it a good idea to tinker around with life? Well, the, the sort of easy answer to that is that probably no one in the room keeps a wolf cub at home, but you might have a puppy or a dog. You probably didn't eat teosinte this summer, but you ate corn. We have been doing genetic modification with organisms for literally 10,000 or more years. This is a different approach, but to say all of a sudden humans should never touch an organism is kind of silly because the, we have that capability now to do things that are far more beneficial for the planet Earth and for life beyond that. And so then the question is, should we? And of course, I feel that not only should we, at least for getting off Earth, but actually if we don't use synthetic biology, we will never solve this up-mass problem. So once you think of life as a technology, you've got the solution. And so with that, I'd like to finish by the way I always finish and say, at Astra, which means to the stars. Thank you very much, Boston.